great. Hi, good afternoon. This is Wednesday afternoon, which means this is two on one, a theological conversation about pop culture or a pop culture conversation about theology. I'm the Reverend Arthur Stewart. And I'm the Reverend Stephanie Kendall, your other co-host. And it is an, a joy for us today to announce that we have our first sponsor, um, Jeff One Row Designs. Two on One is sponsored by Jeff One Row Designs, celebrating 15 years of making ordinary times extraordinary. For 15 years, the creative team at Jeff One Row Designs has been handcrafting liturgical textiles. Their processional banners and seasonal banners grace sanctuaries across the country. Their frontals and paraments adorn altars and lecterns in churches of all sizes. And clergy love their pastor stoles, their deacon stoles, chastables, copes, and all their other vestments. Now, I own three stoles made by Jeff One Row Designs. All of them are from the origami crane stole Good. line. Each one matches the other in quality of material, intentionality of crafting, and pattern while still having individual character. My go-to stole is this one. I've worn it in uh, invoking city council meetings, in marching in pride for three weddings of varying gender combinations, and of course, during Eastertide. Stoles from Jeff One Row Designs are a liturgical utility tool. That is so true, and I love that that stole. Um, so Jeff One Row is proud to include so many of our of of everyone's denominations. So many denominations: Episcopal, Presbyterian, Methodist, ELCA, Lutheran, UCC, DOC, Unitarian, and Roman Catholic. They, he considers all of them amongst his faithful clients. Interfaith and non-denominational clergy love their inclusivity of their designs as well. Uh, so whether you are shopping for the smallest altar accessory or reevaluating your entire collection the way that I am uh, for your vestments or pyramids, Jeff One Row Designs would be honored to work with you and create something that's really perfect for you and your church. Yep. So visit jeffonerow.com for a catalog of stoles, vestments, pyramids, and banners, along with or ordering information and customization possibilities. We thank Jeff One Row Designs for being our lead sponsors because lead sponsor because these stoles still steal the show. You can go to Jeff One Row W U N R O W dot com, and uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, yes, thank you so much uh, to we're we're just really grateful to have uh, incredible partners that value uh, inclusivity and interdenominational and interfaith work uh, the way that we do so because um, that's really what two on one is all about just opening the conversation so thank you. Uh, Arthur, I don't know about you, but I am so excited for today's guest. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna hit admit. Hit admit, uh, oh. friends, we are so excited to welcome the Reverend Kaji Dosha, um, a beloved colleague and friend of mine. Um, and uh, we are going to talk uh, Warrior Nun today, Netflix's Warrior Nun, specifically uh, episode eight of season one. Um, but Kaji, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, sorry, as you, as you took a sip. <laughs> thank you. It's really great to be here. I love this whole concept, so. Thanks. Um, uh, this is normally just the part in which I, I don't want to leave something out, but I know you well, but would you care to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Kaji Dosha. Uh, many others learned, uh, met me as Kaji Spellman, which is my maiden name. And Reverend Stephanie and I work together and at the Park Avenue Christian Church, and where I've been senior So we are having a few connection issues today folks, but be patient with us and we will make things happen. Uh, let's see where she's at. You froze again. Kaji is the senior sure. pastor of Park Avenue Christian Church in New York City on the upper... On the Upper East Side. I, I, listen, I can do a little bit of a Kaji intro since we are, uh, I am her executive minister and she is my senior minister. So uh, we work together at Park Avenue Christian Church, which is located on 85th and Park on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, um, where we are committed to justice seeking ministries and an inclusive um, and welcoming uh, space. Oh, she's gone. So we will hopefully get her right back. Um, and at, but as we are about to talk Warrior Nine, um, I don't know about you, Arthur, but did you have you seen this show beforehand? Because I, I didn't have, even know it existed. 
Like it's and it's it's new. It's been out for four months, five months, July, yeah, August, September. Not particularly new. It's one of the things that I appreciate about Netflix's uh, kind of new line of uh, of production, right? Netflix is coming out with a lot of really cool shows, um, and this being one of them. Um, and yeah, so I hadn't seen it either, and I really enjoyed it um, more so than I was than I thought I was going to. I I I, that, I think that that's part of what really. Um, well, it's like so. There's there's this like there's the syndicated adventure show, mm-hmm. kind of in the vein of Xena or uh, Kung Fu: The Legend Continues. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like when we were yeah. kids and growing up in the. I 90s. know Xena because I have some friends that were very obsessed with her. Um, so and- I was expecting that, and instead, it's this much deeper theological exploration also with some really gory fight scenes you're back hello i'm back sorry about that who knows what's happening the internet is scandalous and scurious yes notoriously awful and wonderful at the same time right so i was explaining who i am would you like me to keep going we would love that yes <laughs> okay so um how much did you hear should i start from the beginning I just start again yeah i give it a little <laughs> like we went and i was like this is so kaji and i know each other because we work together but <laughs> Uh huh. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so that's just it. So my name is Kaji Dosha, Kaji Spellman Dosha, and I'm senior pastor of the park where I work with Reverend Stephanie. And uh, yeah, I've been a New Yorker for years. What can I explain about myself that might be of any interest? I'm also co-chair of the New Sanctuary Coalition, and we do a lot of work on and uh, with on immigrant justice, and we stop deportations. So that's. That's, that's, a, that's, what you do. that's me. <laughs> I'm also a mom, so I have a little one who's very cute and who produced the art that's just behind me, the one that's on the mantle. Oh, I was about to say, wow, that, that painting is <laughs> the one. Uh, the painting is Jacob Lawrence. <laughs> yes, I, I was... <laughs> your little but, one is your little one is pure joy. I adore her. Um, Thank you. Uh, so we were just talking about like how did you uh, how did you find Warrior Nine because it was really off both of our radars and I feel like yeah. we are two that are pretty well versed in pop culture um, and this just totally uh, when you suggested it I was like I don't even know what this is and it took both of us by surprise of how much we enjoyed it so oh good well I'm glad yeah I, I think it's a sleeper show I found it because I when I was on sabbatical I actually started to watch television again. And um, which was quite a delight. And I was looking for like Netflix has these algorithms and they know that I like films or TV shows that have a strong female character lead because I apparently do. That makes sense. So they put me up for this one and I just saw it and I was like, oh, this looks like just what I need. Like I was thinking maybe it would feel kind of like alias and maybe it would be period, but not dystopic because uh, I can't do dystopia yeah life doesn't or art doesn't need to imitate life right now no 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 not for me anyway but other people seem to enjoy it so yeah okay, this- so that's how I found it Netflix gave it to me because it has gotten into my brain <laughs> okay. absolutely and it, it fully passes the Bechtel test right I mean like it is yes. this- uh, as uh, we have, we kind of bring that up in every episode of like, does it pass? Because I too like strong female characters. Uh, you know, as as those of us that are in, in faith leadership, uh, we really hold on to those uh, those strong female characters, um, or we should at least. And mm-hmm. so this uh, this does that really well in a way that um, I don't know was really inspiring in a way. So um, yeah, it's a feel good show while also not glossing or papering over major issues with that and also without sort of hitting you over the head with them either and just fun fact i grew up in a convent so oh. and and i i grew up like right uh, right in a catholic neighborhood because we my family lives near catholic university in the brooklyn neighborhood of dc and so my house was a convent but when my parents bought it from the order of nuns who they were with and then we lived next door to a convent and then the house right behind ours was also a convent. And those were the nuns on the bus, like radical nuns. So I've always thought of nuns as heroes. And uh, yeah, sheroes. 
I, uh, I attended Webster University in St. Louis, Missouri for my uh -huh. undergrad and Webster was founded by the Sisters of Loretto and they were extremists like in the good way where uh, they were the only women seated at the Vatican II Council. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Actually, I might know somebody. Yeah, somebody was seated at Vatican II who I know. So I bet I know someone from that order. Well, there mm -hmm. you go. It's a very small world. I, yes. I <laughs> you clarified your parents bought a convent because I was like, okay, we need to you know, <laughs> yeah. nunchucks because like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The premise yeah, of Warrior you. Nun, if like Spiff and I, you haven't seen it so far, oh, faithful viewers. I mean, we've seen it now, but we're unaware of it up to, I watched it yesterday and just loved it. Um, Warrior Nun is, is there's an order of nuns that are trained to fight actual ethereal demons, like to confront the demonic as it engages in our world. One of the nuns had a halo of the angel, uh, Adriel? Adriel. Yeah, Adriel. Adriel implanted in her back and it's actually passed on from person to person as, as they fight. And this halo in order to protect it and save it during a, 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 an op gone wrong uh, was implanted in the cadaver of a 19 year old quadriplegic who is resurrected or revived? And that's an interesting question we, uh, uh -huh. questions. Um, and so she's, this is the fish out of water entry point where suddenly you're not only now a warrior nun, you are the prime warrior nun, uh -huh. good luck. And it's, 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 it's a fascinating, beautifully shot, well-written show. Um, and I just wanted to give a little primer for our folks who haven't seen think, it. Yeah, I think it's also important uh, that, uh, so the, the lead character's name is uh, Ava. She, she's also an atheist. Like she's not a person that uh, she, uh, that has a faith development or any kind of faith journey uh, other than she has lived in this convent as a quadriplegic and has a lot of kind of um, mixed emotions, let's call it around that. Um, and so in today, so we are talking specifically about episode eight. Um, Which and is so, the yeah. most precise interview we've had so far. And I want to tell you how much I love that. Like it's, it's a <laughs> very specific, so. Yes, it is. Um, but I want to start off with a question that uh, kind of comes from one of the quotes from, um, from, I believe it's Shaka Mary that says it, but she says, as long as, or maybe it's not, sorry, so correct me. But as long as there is darkness in the world, people will need the church. Yes. Uh, so uh, that was Father Vincent. Sorry, it was Father Vincent. But I, 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 I just had that that I, 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 I conflated how I wrote who said what. <laughs> Thank you. It was Father Vincent. Um, uh, but uh, talking about like kind of the need and the necessity of the church, and so I want to kind of pose that to the the three of us, like is the church only for the dark times, right? Or like the, the times in which, and I want to obviously nuance when we say dark, that there's lots of different interpretations. Uh, go see Will Gaffney's tweet uh, or post from yesterday about and the ways in which we talk about and hold uh, darkness in both um, uh, helpful and hurtful ways. But um, yeah. just quoting this quote, is is the time though, is, is the church uh, bigger than, um, than just a, a, a space of, comfort is it it does it does the church exist beyond needing to offer that kind of care um in the world yeah yeah i think that absolutely and i i actually think that what father vincent was kind of getting at is that the church depends on people's suffering in order to have something to offer and and the idea that the church may actually manufacture suffering in order to give people something to have to react to is kind of the context within this episode. So it's uh, it's very interesting to think about ways in which church has in fact needed people to be in a particular position of vulnerability in order to find great value and meaning in liturgy and especially in the authorities of the church because that's church authority is a huge theme for this whole show so i completely disagree with father vincent on this but it actually is a wonderful uh way of entering into what's church about and what should it be versus what it can be absolutely because that's that's i, I also disagreed with father vincent uh, <laughs> 
I think you kind of, those of us in, in church leadership, I, I would hope that we would disagree. Um, mm -hmm. If not, I would really suggest maybe doing some discernment. Um, <laughs> what's happening? Um, it's always fascinating that? how many shows will be like based in the church or centered in the narrative of the church, but it's very clear they don't have a theologian on like the right staff. They have people who have like looked at theology before, but yeah, they, I mean, but it also made a point. So maybe they were bending. Uh, forgive me, that's. No, I just, I think, it, you know, so much of uh, why people turn to church, you know, uh, uh, Kaji and I had, you know, we saw an influx in, in growth during certain time periods in the nation, right? And so uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, people turn to church in times of despair, rather necessarily in times of of great joy, right? Uh, I don't know many, we don't get a lot of new congregants that are like, I'm just kicking life's butt right now. Like this feels amazing. Yeah. I figured I'd join a really great community, which is like what we hope for, right? Like there's something that like, we hope that the the impetus of church is some of is community, is joy, is all the goodness. Uh, but we get people because of the real humanness of, of life. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. So uh, I guess the larger question is, do we think that people come with their humanness into this divine realm because it takes them away from their humanness or because it actually kind of gives them a community for it? Hmm. I think that different people come for many different reasons, though most for exactly what you're saying, but some are really looking for, I mean, the ecstatic experience is, is part of it. And you may want that just because you need a lift of some sort, but you may not be in the depths of despair at the time. And I think that, um, you know, that sort of ontologically rich experience in the, lit in the liturgical life, in the, in, in the interaction with new interpretations of scripture than what they probably were exposed to before. Uh, like, I think that there's some sort of change that we experience and transformation. And so people can start wherever it is that they are for that. Plus a lot of people come to church when they're in points of transition. Like you just had a kid, you want your kid to come up in a community, you know, that sort of thing will often be part of that discernment process as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that What's important to me, because for many of the churches I've served, it was that, that would usually be why people joined. And, and I felt like they weren't actually as well prepared in those communities, especially in suburban churches I've served for the times when they were in the depths because they spent so much time in like the transition and the raising your child place, but not necessarily being ready to deal with that, with those strong contrasting emotions like Father Vincent is highlighting. Absolutely, that's a kind of a long mm -hmm. answer, sorry. <laughs> no, we, we mistake church as a place where we must be happy or where we must always find the bright side, uh -huh. we must present our best self of being yep. broken, struggling, beautiful people. I always, yeah. I, I hate broken language, but I like the idea of like, there's, there's fracture, of course there's fracture. Um, yeah, yeah. So with, with Father Vincent, I think this was in the first episode, and forgive me for stepping outside of the arena of it, but I watched the first episode just to figure out world. Yeah. Um, yeah. He talks about, no, this is episode eight, uh, when he reveals the tattoos, and he said, ah. problem with evil, and he essentially says, I was worried that if we eradicate evil, I would still be a bad person, um, more or less. He, he, he talks yeah. about pandemic mm -hmm. evil but then his own personal failings. Like he didn't feel he was demonically possessed. He just felt he was selfish and lustful and greedy and all this other stuff. And we, something I've struggled with, and, and I think the show asked that question too, is can a person be evil or can a person only do evil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have strong thoughts on this. And the short answer to that is I truly believe that the, there is, an opportunity for redemption for everyone. So I do believe that, but I'm also a total depravity Christian. So, I mean, it's, it's both. <laughs> I, total I think depravity that our, Christian sounds way more fun than it is, by the way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, where's the party? Um, <laughs> have a depravity party. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe that we all are capable of evil. 
And I think that we all are complicit in evil, some more than others. And so, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about do you pray, how do we pray for our enemies? Do you have to? We, Stephanie and I were just talking about that yesterday. And I yeah, I mean- People who watch the show have been talking about it since Friday. <laughs> right. I, you know, I bet they have. <laughs> call me crazy, I don't know. Tis the season. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it makes it easier. You know, I spend a lot of time with my enemies, like a whole lot, like real clear enemies who persecute me and oppress me and my people. And like ICE, for example, just so people have something concrete to say. And um, if I walk in assuming that a person who I'm going to work with is evil mm. per se, like, you know, actually evil themselves, then it makes it a lot harder to work with them and, and to get them to release my friend from detention or whatever. But if I see that, if I treat them with a spirit of love, even if I can't stand them, there's a way to love when you don't like someone. Um, they, they sense it enough. And sometimes, you know, evil has to do with the choices as opposed to with the person themselves. So like calling our, ourselves into better choices, I think is how we get at this. I like that. I, uh, I just preached through Ephesians and some of them were train wreck sermons because parts of Ephesians is a train wreck. Um, we talked about bi biblical authority with household codes of like, I just reject this. Um, <laughs> and you should too, but there's the, uh, we don't fight against, or we struggle not against flesh and blood, but rather powers and principalities and the, and you know, it's, it's with ice. I, and, and, and I don't want to go, I don't want to go further than I'm invited to with your, uh, work with and through and against what some of the stuff they do, but it's the system too, that must be dismantled that is perpetuated. Right. And, you know, there's people participating in it, but unless Chad Wolf is on your speed dial and even he wouldn't be necessarily, I'm going to stop. I'm babbling. <laughs> Hey, made it almost halfway through the episode before the first Arthur hedges out and squirrels away on a question. <laughs> Pretty good for those of you keeping track at home. It's true. Yeah, and for those of you keeping track at home, I'm actually in a lawsuit. I'm suing him right now, so. Oh, I'm <laughs> <Yeah. sorry. laughs> No, it's public. Okay. Look up D uh, Dosha V D H S. Cool. <laughs> There's the plug. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's let's. Okay. Let's. I'm gonna bring us back. I think into kind of what Arthur was talking about, like in the the um, the leadership and principalities of who we who like where does authority lie, right? And in yeah. especially in this, because uh, one of the things that I really appreciated, especially in I think it's on this episode. I will name that I got really into this. I did the first episode and the eighth episode as well to kind of like get the world. And then I went nine and ten because I was just like. Uh. This no, I, I, I don't. I you know I, where it's going. I do know where it's going. Uh, yeah. So, I, but I think I kept it to this episode with my nose. Um, but so there is actually it is. So Ada's got the halo, right? Ava. Ava's mm -hmm. got the halo. She is the leader. If you think of it in that way, right? Like you've been given the thing that many want, and yet uh, her sisters around her are really who lead this charge. You know, she kind of makes the joke like. I'm leading, you should follow me, but like, she doesn't know what's going on. And like, they all know that. Um, so what can the church learn from kind of that expansive leadership model of, you know, um, if we look at maybe the halo as an anointing of, of some regard of authority, you know, here's, here's your male authority, here's your ordained authority, whatever okay. that looks like, uh, especially for those of us that serve congregational, congregationally based churches, um, that, that, you know, the gifts really lie in, um, in in the ability to let gifts flourish yeah Our authority lies in, in the ability to let gifts flourish so uh i guess what is uh what is your take on that as far as as a faith leader um both in congregational settings but in, uh in expansive settings as you so often lead um you know marches and protests and just people writ large yeah, I think this is, this is something the show gets at really well because the authority keeps shifting in many ways and, and they all reject the authority that has been placed on them. So for example, you know, it's not as much in this episode, but leading up to it, you see all sorts of conflict between Mother Superior 
uh, which is just an interesting term in this setting, and, and you know the Vatican leadership, which is a thing. And then we also have the conflicts between of, of authority between um, and resistance to authority when it's wrong between Mary, for example, and Father Vincent in this episode. So for example, he they, when they're going out to the guy's house and um, and she's got her gun in her or two guns in her lap because <laughs> oh, she's, she's known as shotgun Mary. Uh, so she's sitting there with her guns in her lap and uh, and this is a powerful black woman. That's another thing I love about this show is that it's so beautifully cast. It's very diverse yeah. and not in a token it's, way you know anyway so she's sitting there and she's this warrior she's a nun and um or no actually i don't know if mary is her she's a little bit different but anyway so next to her is um father vincent he's like okay wait here and she's like no <laughs> not even a question <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> right it wasn't, even, it wasn't even the trope it was just the complete rejection <laughs> of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and i wasn't used to that because i'm used to people just sort of listening to the guy uh, who tells the woman what to do or whoever else is there. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. The other thing uh, that I noticed in the episode that really gets at what you're getting at, um, Stephanie, is while Ava is trying to, like, it's not exactly, they re reject a lot of the hero tropes. So she's trying to make her way through the wall and she can't possibly do it without the help of her sister, you know? And that fact is so beautiful because they are showing just how much they need each other. And, you know, at the end of the episode, when she finally makes her way through the eight foot wall or 12 foot wall, whatever that it was, um, the way that the tenderness with which her sister caught her at the end, you know, and she said, uh, I'm trying to remember what her name is. I never remember characters' Beatrice. names. Beatrice. 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 Yes. Beatrice. Yeah. So Beatrice then catches her and what did she say? Oh, as, as she is, is saying, preparing her, she says, you would still have us, because, okay, so Ava's saying um, that she needs support, she's afraid, she learns that she's afraid of paralysis again, and she says, I'm afraid of being alone, and then Beatrice responds, you would still have us, and we would never leave you. And something about, like, even if, she, even if you were paralyzed, like, even if you couldn't be the warrior nun, you would still have us and we would still be with you. And all of this ties in so beautifully to what um, Mary said at the very beginning of the episode, because they're like some blah, 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 church, this church, that. And uh, this is my favorite quote, as you asked me for one. And she said, I care more about my sisters than I do about church. And that feels like real church to me, actually. <laughs> so that, Wrote the same thing and that's mm -hmm. the authority and relationship um mm -hmm. the, uh, so within this episode ava is trying to pass through 20 feet of stone in preparation to raid a catacomb and there's this wonderful kind of unspoken metaphor of she's passing through this into death and mm -hmm. death is, I, well I, I won't take that dance off my card yet but um and what what occurs too is there's this story that happens and it, there's a journal and the journal is the record of, I think, the Halo Bearers. Is that correct? Did I pick that mm -hmm. up? And so yeah. they read a story about uh, one, the one who had it in part of World War II, and she was a lesbian and, and escaped from camps. And, and uh, the, the story was told, and you know, it was like, oh, OK, so I'm supposed to. And, and Beatrice was like, no, you need to pay attention. What I'm trying to tell you, and she pushes back. And I saw that as the greatest affirmation of leadership in there. We, we rely on hierarchy in the church, whether we mean to or not. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite lay leaders to work with are the ones who will say to me, Arthur, you're absolutely full of crap. We don't need to do this right now. Instead of, okay, well, how do we make Arthur's crazy hatched scheme a reality? Um, mm -hmm. But that's what strengthens relationship is, is pushback uh, because there has to be friction. And I, I loved Beatrice in this episode. That's, I'm sorry, there's not a question, except isn't Beatrice cool? So uh, Beatrice is so cool. She's she's very cool. Uh, the actress who plays her is also very interesting. You like look her up because she has lots of interesting things to say. Very brilliant person. But uh, yeah, so Sister Melanie's story, you know, escaping from Dachau, uh, who she was 
she was a Christian, like a nun, but she was being persecuted by the Nazis for being a lesbian, lesbish, as, uh, as she says, um, then goes on this killing spree, right, where she kills a bunch of Nazis, which feels very cathartic sort of in the storytelling. But then uh, she says, Sister Melanie says, I passed through fear, hatred, and then the halo shone. You know, she had to get through that and the halo wasn't what was putting her on the killing spree. So she had to kind of like learn. And she said, in the moment I felt unbound and unburdened, I felt finally myself. And again, this whole thing about passing through is a big theme. And I don't know, like, I don't know if they have a theologian on staff, but uh, on their writing, in their writing room. But of course, this is baptismal, you know, as we mm. pass through, as we go into the waters, we die to the power of sin and we come out resurrected and renewed by the grace of God. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I always think when I think of pass through, I like passing through the stone, passing through the waters. It is, you know, dying to death, rising a new life. Very baptismal to me. I like that a lot. And you know, I had a, uh, I had a youth <laughs> years ago when I was in Texas and um, I don't rebaptize because if your first one doesn't work, your second one's not going to work either. Um, and your first one works is the implication, but he was baptized as an infant and he said, I would like to be baptized again. And I said, no. And he said, okay, I would like to affirm my baptism by being buried underwater publicly and then brought up uh, formally. I said, that sounds a lot like a baptism. He said, well, we all, and like I made him kind of walk through the theology, but what I loved is at one point he said, I would do it in dirt, but I don't trust you can lift me out of six feet of dirt. <laughs> and uh, I just, I was thinking about that with passing through the rock of like, mm -hmm. and at least she knew how to sidestep and get out so she didn't suffocate or freak out. Mm -hmm. with loneliness um, and her fear of being alone. Mm -hmm. And going back to in times of, I'm sorry, Spiff, I feel like I'm talking no, far In times of conflict or in times of great friction, people seek out the church in part to provide solace and comfort. We talked about this earlier and I think it's to provide community, it really is. But we'd rather see it as we have a great family game night on Friday nights, but rather it's let's sit and go, oh my God, what do we do next rather? Mm -hmm. With Ava, she starts the series, not even, she starts it dead, but she, prior to that, she's in a convent, uh, hospice, hospital, orphanage thing. She's a quadriplegic, with the exception of Diego, is that the boy's name? Um, oh, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, the little boy who was her yeah. friend. She's basically alone and despised. Mm -hmm. What does the promise of community do in transformation? Like not even community, just the promise of it, the possibility of it. Yeah. Um, what yeah, is it able to be accepted over and over again? Well, of course. So, so Ava emerges from the trauma of abuse by the church into the hands of another church community. And much like many who we know who have experienced something similar, it takes her some time to figure out what that's gonna mean for her. And, and in the episodes you haven't seen that intervene between one and eight, you get to see her trying to find her community. Like she doesn't wanna be with the nuns. She wants to go and just like live. <laughs> and, and like she hangs out with this crowd of bandits who just squat in people, rich people's houses. And it's, it's an interesting arc. Which is <laughs> wonderful. I loved everything about all of those characters and I have no idea what mm -hmm. happened to them. And and so I think a lot of times, I think what they're trying to show here is that she is, she's forming, it's very queer, like she's forming her own community, right? She's forming her own family and she's deciding I'm going to do that, even though, you know, she doesn't have it, anyone else at that point. And so then as she starts to realize that she needs to, she needs help, you know, she goes to wherever she can get it and, and pulls together enemies to do it, which is also really interesting, you know, just as like an Alinsky trained organizers, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. Um, we wonder like, how does that play out into this? Because she's pulling together the doctor um, and, you know, the church authority, the former Vatican guy 
with, you know, this crowd of nuns who have their own thing and they don't trust each other, but they need each other in order to prepare her for this work. They have a common goal. So, you know, the building of community and of allies and partners is also very fascinating in, in how they construct the series. Yeah, you want to? No, I am talking. So much, so much <laughs> I'm learning to read Arthur's faces via Zoom over these months of like when we each have something to say. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited. That's all. Um, well, I, I mean, I, again, I've just, I've really enjoyed kind of the complexity of everything that is um, happening. And just in this one episode was just like, oh my goodness. Um, but one of the things that so they talk about is kind of that lineage of the halo um, and how she's been kind of, how uh, Ava's been kind of onboarded onto this team of sister nuns that she doesn't trust. They, you know, they don't trust her per se, but kind of half, they trust the halo. So there's a lot of kind of layers of trust that are in there. Um, so I'm wondering what both of you kind of respond to in, uh, especially in, in today's times where um, we seem to be fighting the same fights over and over again historically. Um, mm -hmm. And so do they, um, it kind of turns out. And so what can we learn as a body of faith from Warrior Nun in the, um, in the lineage of fighting for justice, right? Or, uh, Part of me wants to be really sad that we are continuously having to do this. And one of us wants to, and part of me wants to be inspired that I come from a long history of fighters. Um, okay. And there's, I think that there's truth in both of those, but I'm wondering where that sits with both of you. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, <laughs> something that a lot of us have been talking about, especially since uh, Stand Back and Stand By, uh, I wonder who the warrior nuns are, like literally people who are armed and fighting, um, you know, and prepared to fight. And I'm not suggesting that people should be armed and prepared to fight, but uh, I, I do wonder who they are. It, do they exist? Um, is there, are we headed into a civil war? I don't know these things, but if we were, like who would, what would the sides be? How would people be prepared? I don't know that, but um, I do think that the kinds of conflicts that will draw us into such stark camps so much, um, I just think it's, the term progressive is something, you know, Guthrie and I argue about this, um, is something that really challenges me because it assumes that we've made progress and or that we can that there is just like a progression towards justice and i'm not sure if there is uh, i just don't know because i do see so many things getting recycled and of course you know the fact that you and i can serve this church is progress uh, i don't know how long that progress will go though i mean i don't know if we're going to be in the handmaid's tale in a few weeks yep yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> sorry to be so awful no, no but that's that's just Fair and true. I mean, that's just, I, I, I like that there isn't one vision of progress that there, you know, or like, or, or one way to get there as part of what I'm hearing is like, there's definitely a vision cast for what progress would look like. That's, you know, hope is alive, uh, but how we get there, right? Well, sometimes, mm -hmm. most times hope is alive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there isn't that one vision of how to get there. Um, because for so long that one vision has been named by like cis het straight right. white men right and so like which has left out what actually justice looks like uh what right. hope looks like and how to actually and actually get there mm -hmm. so um yeah arthur i i'm really glad to hear that there's other people who struggle with the term progressive um, because sometimes I've noticed the progressive side of things is as purity driven as the more conservative side. And I, I, I don't know what it means to be progressive always. I will say it wasn't the stand back and stand by that really lit up my timeline. It was Alito and Thomas's um, dissent mm -hmm. to uh, hear Kim Davis's argument because suddenly all of the white gay men I knew, <laughs> and it was all the white gay men who were totally silent and a lot wow. of what was happening were wow. like, it's time to go burn down the system. 
-hmm. And a few of them I actually called and said, you should have been saying that with Brianna. You should have been saying that when we were talking about uh, when the stuff came out about Jeff Sessions being the little tiny Keebler devil. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of it. And I think progressivism has to be expansive and that's no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, but what if your tent is, just has to be bigger right now to house more folk? Um, I did want to ask with the halo being passed on and having a lineage, is mm -hmm. Ava revived or is Ava resurrected? And maybe there's <laughs> something in the final episode that decides that and I don't know, but yeah, I'm fine saying resurrected. Yeah. I'm I'm totally fine with that. But what 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 distinction are you making between the two? I always I struggle with resurrection versus resuscitation. Um, because people it's it's the passion of the Christ did so many things horribly wrong. And one of the things it absolutely did is it showed Jesus like sitting up. And the whole point is we don't see that. Scripture does not say that happened. Scripture says the tomb is empty, that, you know, and it's the resurrected. I, I don't want to get into bodily <laughs> resurrection today. Mm -hmm. but there's a difference, I think, between going back to what once, going back to what one once was and to um, becoming something new and therefore no longer hindered by what was. But I, there, there's a gray area very much in Warrior Nun on purpose, surely, about that. Mm -hmm. If the halo was removed, and again, I'm the one out of the three of us who has not seen the last two episodes. If the mm -hmm. halo was removed, would Ava collapse? Mm -hmm. Or did she? I mean, spoilers abound, folks. If you haven't figured that one out, I don't know what to do for you. <laughs> what do you think, Stephanie? I go more for resurrection because for me, resurrection has a, 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 a holy hand in it. Um, that mm -hmm. resuscitation and uh, reviving is very much like I, those are things that I attribute to a skill set uh, for the most part for doctors, for the very human, uh, those of us that have uh, leaned into the gifts of healing um, and can do that for me. And so the fact that there is this kind of holy hand that she was dead, there was nothing that she could do and she can now, you know, what, if she were to just be have been resuscitated, she still would have been quadriplegic. Like she, she would have been alive and uh, and um, sentient, but not necessarily, uh, you know, fully active and alive in in body in the way that she is. So well, for me, it's it, it's it's a resurrection. And the church prays for revival, and the church prays for resuscitation. And I don't know how comfortable the church is praying for resurrection because you have to die first. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, we, we call Easter a time of resurrection for all of us and say that we are, um, but we all, we also will use the term revive, but we will say that, you know, um, we are made new uh, and that's, there's resurrection that can be um, literal and also resurrection that can be metaphorical. Um, I think now that I've had a chance to think about your question, I would say whether or not it's resurrection probably depends on the source of the halo. Mm -hmm. So if the halo is indeed holy, um, then yes, I would call that resurrection. Yeah, and I am specifically using just episode eight's understanding yes. of the halo. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> hey, so here's that everyone go watch the rest of uh, Warrior. I know I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been it has been renewed for a new season so like all Ooh. kinds of other things are gonna um are gonna emerge so who knows will be revealed uh, <laughs> come back for season um so uh one of my favorite things that i uh, that is kind of throughout all of this is their kind is the wearing on saying um in this life or the next it's kind of mm -hmm. their like their their kind of recommitment to each other uh from seeing that uh, or as they go into all of this, right? And so I'm wondering uh, what we what we are to do. And I think I have an understanding of it. Like, what is that? What is the in this life for the next for the church? Like, what is the saying that kind of ties us together? And does that kind of that specific saying in this life or the next, um, does that offer some sort of courage because they know that there is a next life, right? I feel like some of the fear that we encounter as humans is that like is that fear of faith that they kind of um have a 
that they talk about in, in Warrior Nun is that like we are fearful of moving into that next space because we don't necessarily know what that next space is. And the Warrior Nuns do know that that next space exists, right? That this life was. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I wonder if the church now has that sort of a phrase that we can think of or, you know, whatever, uh, to, to offer some of that hope uh, as we go into these next phases, both socially and morally and in the church life and in social life and in all of yeah. that. I'm, I'm looking for that line of hope, I think. Yeah, I was, uh, this came up a bit in my conversation with Jackie Lewis on Monday because we were talking about, someone asked us about unity. And um, so if, I think that you, in your question, it sort of implies that if there is something that the whole, the thread for the whole church to pull on, it must have some sort of unified vision. And I, I don't actually know that the church does, but, it, but what I wanted, the quote I had wanted to say on Monday, which I couldn't think of the whole thing in the right way is um, in, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity, right? And um, if we ever had pulled that off, then that might be the thread. I just, I'm just not sure, but I think that that's a good one. It'd be a nice one anyway. <laughs> I'm spending a lot of time in First Corinthians. Check that off your bingo sheet, Spiff. Um, and the whole <laughs> aspect of unity versus uniformity is is one, uh -huh. of the, as you well know, is one of the driving things in it. Um, all right, we are uh, coming into well, it. I, I, hold on, I want to go. I, I do think though that there there's something there in the in the need for I don't know, like what. Of the things that we say in church, amen, peace be with you, you know, mm. like that, like, like the, you know, um, that's kind of, I think, oh, where, I see. where mm -hmm. uh, I'm seeing some similarities and I'm wondering if you all are as well, if, is, if, you know, like the Christ in me sees the Christ in you or the idea of Ubuntu or something, you know, and it, like all of these kind of spaces that like we hold holy and the language that we use in our kind of um, common communities um uh, does that function in that same way or should it i guess that's a better way of maybe phrasing that as the same way as in this world or the next yeah yeah i like the idea of amen being a unifying feature of church also because it's used in other faith traditions as well and the idea of let it be so is very open and expansive um i like that that's pretty cool when I think it, there's a shorthand, um, my kiddo, uh, we pray. And when she says something really good in a prayer, I will say amen without thinking about it. And she'll stop and be like, I'm not, I'm not done. <laughs> right. And so like, we're working on like, no, yeah. I think about like in recovery communities, um, in, in particular meetings of a certain secret society I may or may not belong to, uh, they, if, if there's like a really wild, share uh something they'll say is keep coming back which means you're kind of nuts we hope you're working your program we think a long time from now you might achieve a better level of sobriety wow you're crazy like there's a lot packed into it and mm -hmm. we do that with this life or the next we may die we may mm -hmm. I, I know y'all know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. yeah. um i do just want to point out by the way with lilith um, the, the Lilith was resurrected or revived, or there's something happening in episode eight, and I don't know. <laughs> I need to watch the full season, Kaji, and I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, we can't talk about Lilith without spoilers. So, well, yeah. Lilith does <laughs> to Ava. They they had, had struggle, and she said, "I was fighting against you instead along instead of alongside you," and mm -hmm. she just flat out says, "I hope you'll forgive me," and Ava says, "I just did." Mm -hmm. Is forgiveness that simple? Or can forgiveness be that? Oh, simple? yeah. <laughs> you know, I took notes on that too in the episode because Lilith gave such a beautiful apology. Mm -hmm. it, it was a real apology as opposed to a bad mm -hmm. one. I think I wrote down how she said it to, uh, do, 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 where is it? Um, go ahead. No, it's something about pride versus responsibility. Because my notes here are pride mm -hmm. versus responsibility. And that's how she asked that she leaned in her pride rather than leaning into her responsibility to the sisterhood. Um, mm -hmm. You have the quote. That's great. I no, I, I didn't write it all out. Sorry. 
no and uh so that that just to like feed you some of those that language that she had as you were going to say mm -hmm. yeah so i i really appreciated that that was a another thing where it was a real model of of um care and in the comic book series i guess it's probably no i, can, I don't think i can say without really doing a huge spoiler but it's one of those times where you need to know more in order to understand, like, is it resurrection? Is it revival? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think we've hit our final question. I think we've come <laughs> to that time. Um, Kaji, oh. thank you so much for being with us um, and talking uh, Warrior Nun, which has been just really wonderful. Um, and so you get to answer the, the final question first. And our final question uh, is, as always, what character, Bible, story, narrative uh, uh, are you most reminded of in Warrior Nun? Yeah, so I mean, the, what's really interesting if people are unfamiliar with the series is that each episode is named after a part of the, uh, a story or a um, quote from the Bible. And this one is the Proverbs 14.1, which of course Proverbs is not a narrative, <laughs> but what that, uh, I think it's worth engaging with the, what it says is the wise woman builds her house with her own hands. The foolish tears hers down. Mm. And, um, you know, as this episode engages that piece of wisdom, it's both, right? Because what they're doing is trying to tear down some injustice at the Vatican, right? That's the overall plan, which is tearing something down. But then they're also building this house, which is their own community, right? And that's really powerful to me. And again, that ties into Mary saying, you know, I care more about my sisters than I do about the church. It ties into breaking through the walls, you know, because as she breaks into the catacombs, she's breaking down. They're trying to destroy like the whole source of the source of evil within the church. And, um, and it challenges whether or not church should exist as it does, which I think is a really interesting, really, really interesting question. Mm. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Either way to go. Well, no, the, the scriptures on the episode titles, and all of them are named after scriptures, it's an interesting little Easter egg almost, because this show is yeah. meant to be just watched on stream mm -hmm. and not so... I, I didn't realize that about the scripture. I remember seeing that and didn't look it up. And sorry, that just kind of, um, mm -hmm. my answer to it is the paralyzed young man who is carried by four friends because everything that happens in the scripture is a resurrection story. Everything in the gospels, 100% of it. And there's the whole, they bury him through the roof and it's to Christ and in Christ he's able to rise and burr, burr, burr. Um, and I mean, she, it, it's a cheap answer. I admit it because of the whole like, oh, paralysis, oh, passing through, but I'm going for it. Spiff? I went with uh, Ava as Miriam, um, Miriam and all her women um, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, in Exodus 15, 20. Um, and I kind of Easter egged it into our uh, Instagram for those of you that follow us. Um, so, uh, yeah, for me, it very much, um, there's this anointing, right, of Miriam. She's kind of, she's in it because her brothers are in there. I mean, she's a prophet, don't get me wrong, but there's an understanding of who she is in her familial system and in the larger system. And um, Exodus 15, 20, it's just her, it says, and then Miriam and all the women went with her. And it's very much uh, this understanding of this sisterhood, as I see it, where there is conflict in between it, right? We don't, it, we're just not nuanced in our scriptures, but mm -hmm. like, uh, I imagine, you know, that some of the ways in which Miriam and some of the, her Liliths and her Beatrices and her, you know, all of those women, like, that they supported each other, had cast some similar visions together, went out and did it, and yet um, kind of also uh, existed in their own kind of family system, like, within the larger system um, of the Exodus. So for me, that was, uh, I, I, I went with Miriam. I yeah, it. I can see it. That's very Phyllis Tribble. Uh, <laughs> yes, a few. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, uh, Kaji, thank you a thousand, a million times, uh, not only for taking time out of your full and busy schedule in life to come here, but for introducing us to Warrior Nun, which I, that's going to be my Friday show till I finish it. Like, I'm so thrilled. Uh, 
Thank you for joining us on two on one as well. Maybe with the second season, we can try to jump back on mm -hmm. as well because there's a lot to talk about. It's a uh, date. Excellent. Wonderful. And forgive me because we're, we're, we're new with our sponsor, uh, Jeff Wanro Designs. May we put you in a waiting room for just a moment while we wrap sure. up the episode? Thank you because I still want to thank you when we're done recording. So give me one moment and I'm going to click things and I'm not prepared for this. We'll see you soon again. Bless Bye. You. Thanks, everybody. Watch the show. Uh, okay. Let me share my screen. Guys, we're still learning how to do this, but we're really thankful. All right. Friends, again, we are grateful for Jeff Wenro Designs who have uh, signed on as our top sponsor. And so um, we hope that you will go to jeffwenro.com, get yourself a new stall or a robe, or if you if your church is coming back into a season of worship, or if you are doing something online, a, a worship plan online that is, um, that, you know, you want to you want to design up your house, uh, call Jeff Wenro. Yeah. Um, now is a perfect time to say, do we want our vestments and our altar cloths and our frontals? Do we want to refresh it and make it look like something new and beautiful and amazing? It's high quality, good stuff. Thank you very much, Jeff Wanro Designs. Hey, Spiff, who's coming up on our docket? Oh my goodness, we have an incredible lineup coming up. Uh, so we have uh, next week, Lori Walk. Um, I, I believe I'm saying her last name correctly, but she is talking Dolly Parton, the entire canon of Dolly Parton. Just well, we'll be working nine to five. We were working nine to five. Well done. Uh, and then uh, we have Jamie Plunkett with the West Wing because the West Wing has a um, a new kind of episode coming out. So we'll be talking about that. And is the Mandy overall, what is Mandy in it? No, Mandy's not in it because Mandy is not in season three. Um, so uh, we will have that, and then we will close out our Politico October, however we're saying that, uh, with the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler. So we have Ooh. some incredible uh, guests lined up for the month of October. And if you'd like to be one of our guests for November, hit us up at 2on1project uh, at Gmail. Follow us online. Uh, some of you are sliding into our DMs asking if you can be a guest. Ooh. Uh, and the answer is yes. So um, come well, back. Thank you so much. There's only a few exceptions, like Travis Smith McKee, who promised us a theme song and hasn't delivered it. Absolutely. I'm just kidding, Travis. You can come back anytime. Anyways, this has been Two on One. I am Arthur Stewart, joined, of course, by the Reverend Stephanie Kendall. Goodbye, everybody.